This is The Crime Cafe, your podcasting source of great crime, suspense, and thriller writing. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I bring on my guest, don't forget that you can buy The Crime Cafe 9 book set and The Crime Cafe short story anthology for only $1.99 and 99 cents each. Just go to my website, debbiemack.com, and uh, click on Crime Cafe, where you'll find the buy links. While you're there, please subscribe to the podcast on either iTunes or Stitcher. And if you're watching this, you know we're on YouTube as well. So you can subscribe to that channel. Now, having said that, it's my great pleasure to bring on best-selling author Vincent Zandri. Vince, I am so thrilled to finally have you on my show and to meet you this way, so to speak, uh, after so many years of our first contact online. So I know, it's been so long. Coming on. It's been many years. <laughs> and I remember one time you, you saying that you would love yeah. to meet. And uh, even though we haven't gotten to meet in person, it's nice to be able to do this. Oh, Deb, I was probably just flirting with you at the time. <laughs> well, that's very nice. That's very kind. And I'm, I'm quite, um, I guess, uh, what's the word? Uh, the... <laughs> Um, oh, you, you, you can't even, you can't I even think, think. You can't, you can't. It's you're speechless, flattered. you're speechless. I'm speechless, I'm Actually, speechless. Aww. <laughs> and it, well, truth be told, um, I was in awe of your first book, uh, and it did so well, and uh, you were like one of the um, groundbreakers for who was the one of the first people um, to like, you know what, I'm not going the traditional route, like I'm totally gonna do this, and boom, you hit the New York Times, and uh, well, with a great, kinda... great, great noir novel, so that's why I was in awe of you, to be perfectly honest. Oh, well, that's really nice of you to say. I am flattered, Vincent, that, that's kind. Um, interesting that you bring up genre, because um, how would you describe your writing in one sentence? Are you mainly a thriller writer, a noir writer? a mystery writer, adventure? Uh, if I had to sum it up in one sentence, I don't know, this might sound namby-pamby, but uh, I like to write what I like to read. That sounds good. Simple, yeah, and it's as simple as that. Um, you know, um, sometimes there's like the literary events. Mm -hmm. um, a book like When Shadows Come. Uh, which Thomas and Mercer did, which like my mother or even some of my best fans will be like, huh, what was that book about? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you know, and then, and then there'll be books like, uh, like the shroud key, for instance, you know, which I did under my own label, which, and they'll be like, oh my God, I can't, you know, you gotta go to the next page. 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 And, and you eat it up like potato chips, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then there, um, and then there's the Vince who writes like psychological suspense, like, um, um, I don't know, name one, like, oh, the remains for instance, which is like mm -hmm. my, my big ass seller, I guess. Um, and I even wrote that from a female perspective, um, which is just sort of a relentless, you know, that's, it's sort of a combination of like this, of the of like, it's got hard boiled in it, it's got um, romance in it, it's got adventure in it, it's got that that Hitchcock psychological suspense mm -hmm. in it. So it's, so it's got all of it in there. And now even more recently, I've ventured into, and I blame Richard Godwin for this, um, but uh, I, I've ventured into um, erotic noir a little bit. Wow. Yeah. And which which wasn't I, I wasn't sure if I could pull it off, and I'm still not entirely sure if I've pulled it off. <laughs> um, but the reviews have been good, and to me it was like, well, a lot of noir and hard boiled fiction has a lot of sex in it anyway, so just take it a step further. Um, but I think it's kind of working because, it, 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 and and I think the plot is good. But anyway, the point being that I'm still experimenting. Yeah. Um, and I've even ventured into, um, I have a young adult coming out in, in uh, 
January as well. Very cool. I'm looking so, forward I'm to that it. because I would love to read that one. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's actually the Chase Baker series again, but it's young Chase Baker. I love that idea because I was just thinking Chase Baker is such compulsively readable, readable stuff. Um, oh, I appreciate that. It is very much so. Uh, I see from your blog that you were a photojournalist. How long did you do that, and what did you cover? Um, I was. I mean, I started out as as a, as a reporter for um, like a stringer for uh, uh, the local paper in Albany, New York, called the Times Union, which is still there. Um, and at a time in the early '90s, in the very early '90s, when like um, it was still, you know, you could they still had stringers and they still hired freelancers and all that sort of stuff, and it was pre-internet and all that mm -hmm. stuff and you went and covered a story and yes. went into the plant and wrote it and and mm -hmm. all that stuff and it was great and i you know I, I was geared for the construction business so i didn't know how to become a writer i just knew i wanted to be and so like i, I like looked up all my heroes like faulkner and hemingway and all these mm -hmm. guys and and i discovered like uh, they just started at the newspapers right and so i was like well that's what i'm that that's what i'm gonna do and so I did that, and then I ventured on to like writing short stories for the, for the literary journals and things like that. And then um, I went to writing school, and I wrote for magazines, and and I just worked my way up, you know. And and by the time I was in my late twenties, I went to the I went to writing school, and the the book I had to write for my uh, creative thesis ended up being my first novel, mm -hmm. um, the the Innocent, and that got picked up by Delacorte and. And, I, you know, so I've been kind of doing it ever since, you know. Oh, yeah. and, and to, to, answer your, to answer your original question, um, this business being as cyclical as it is, there's good years and bad years. So I would always go back to journalism. And uh, back in the early, in the mid-2000s, 2007, 8, 9, 10, um, I was working for some foreign news outlets mm -hmm. like RT and some others and... Uh, just really just traveling all over the place and writing stories like in Africa and, uh, you know, China and Russia on any number of topics um, and uh, kind of making my living that way for a while, you know, because uh, I was going through my, I had gone through my second divorce or whatever, and it was just sort of always on the road. Wow. You know? And uh, for some people, that for would be like a dream job. Material. Oh, it was. And I actually ended up, um, I actually ended up using Florence as sort of my home base, and uh, in in like a fifth floor guest house walk up, which is right down the road from me now. Now I have an apartment, but um, and it was like twenty euros a night, but I had my own bathroom, <laughs> you know, which was cool. <laughs> and I and I remember like one of the biggest one of the most profitable like stories I sold. I remember I got the, I got the, like I, I pitched it at like six o'clock in the evening here mm -hmm. and to, to Moscow and, and they came back and it was all about how uh, at the time, I think it was 2010, the governor had said like New York state is going to be broke within 30 days. And so that's kind of a big deal being mm -hmm. that like New York city is the financial capital of the world. Yeah. Um, and so like, I'm writing a story about Albany, New York, really, because it's the capital where I come from, from Florence, Italy, for a Moscow newspaper or a news outlet. And it ended up being like the top story that night in Eastern Europe. Wow. So it, it, it was super cool. And they like, in like, they paid like so well. And I was like, I was like floored. It was great. Oh anyway. my God, that's fantastic. That's really fantastic. But back th yeah, and, but back then it was more like I was doing more journalism and sort, of, and I had been back to like writing like fiction was more, you know, when I had the time I was writing fiction. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like back to like almost, I'd say 99.9% .9 all fiction, unless somebody asks me to write an article for them, then I'll do it. But mm -hmm. um, if the pay is good enough, but you know, so 
things, you know, there'll probably come a time again, maybe that I'll go back to journalism. I don't know. Whatever. Well, you never know. But having that option is nice. And oh, yeah. um, would you say you generally write series novels or standalones? I do both. Mm -hmm. I do both. And um, the standalones, it's a different. The series novels for me are like, that's like fun. Mm -hmm. You know, like throwing my characters who I love. Um, I just love, you know, like throwing them into situations and they're funny and, you know, and. You get to know their um, quirks and a lot of, and so on. Yeah, you know, and what they're capable of and what they're not capable of, and and their, you know, the, I know their bank accounts, which are usually in the red, and I know mm -hmm. their, you know, their lost loves, and and but they're, you know, like I always try to, I always try to portray a, um, a strong sense of morality with these these guys or whatever. Some of them are some of them are more political than others, and they like differ in their political views, and they're not all the same. But the standalones, they take longer. Um, they, um, they, you know, it's you have to create a whole new world for them, as you know, and yes. and uh, it it takes a lot longer. It takes much more of an emotional and a physical investment. Um, it's much more like writing a, a literary novel. You know, the language has got to be right, and um, so so I just I'm actually finishing one right now called the girl who wasn't there and uh and i'm i think i'm like forty thousand words into another one that i don't have a title for um but but it, it's a lot of work that's one of the reasons i come to italy still to write the novels because so like look at if like the house burns down <laughs> I, I, i'm over here i can't do anything about it <laughs> But it's cool that you have a place in Italy. Very cool. Yeah. So, well, um, you know, it's funny you bringing up uh, Hemingway and Faulkner as inspirations because I know that I was inspired by the likes of Hemingway and Faulkner. And uh, right. one of the things I thought I needed to do when I first started writing, I mean, when I was very young, I have old handwritten stuff that I did um, about Vietnam vets because I thought, you know, wow. based on Hemingway, I thought you had to be like a war correspondent to be a real writer. You know what <laughs> I mean? And right, right, um, right, sure. so I tried getting into the head of a Vietnam vet. And I look at it right. now and I kind of cringe, of course. But at the same time, I go, you right. know, I wasn't half bad. <laughs> there was something no. there that nobody pointed out to me that nobody said, hey, you're the best writer ever, or, you know. Actually, that's not entirely true. I shouldn't say that. There were teachers who were very encouraging, but I wish I'd been a little bit more encouraged earlier on. You know what I'm saying? Oh, sure. I mean, um, I mean, what? I mean, did you always want to be a writer? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been wanting to be a writer all my life, pretty much. Um, from the first time I I started watching television. I mean, I knew there were right. people, I had this awareness that there were people who wrote it, mainly from watching right. the Mary, the uh, Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> no, you're so, oh my God, you're so right. You're absolutely yeah. right. I remember my parents, I remember my mother saying like, oh, that's not, you know, like Dick Van Dyke isn't so funny or Mary Tyler Moore isn't so funny. They would always say, because my father was a musician too, you know, and he'd mm -hmm. play for some of these people. And they'd say, oh my God, the writers are so good. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. You know, the, right, the, it, the writers are so clever. The, and the fact that you had people doing creative work in your family is part right. of what goes into it, I think. Because my dad was right. a writer, he was a playwright. Oh, really? Yes. No kidding. And um, so when he found out that I really wanted to make a go of being a writer, he was so supportive. But that yeah, was yeah, yeah. years after high school and all that kind of stuff. But um, <laughs> yeah, having that in your background, I think, makes a big difference. Um, it makes you oh, realize the does. possibilities. Um, so, right. so I'm always, you know, like encouraging younger people if they have any inclination toward writing, you know, keep doing it, keep doing it. Um, right, right. But um, 
You've done a lot of, um, I've noticed, Amazon digital shorts. Is that, is I, that I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's in my bio still. I don't know why it's in my bio. I noticed it's in your bio, yeah. Uh -huh. But um, one of which I can't find. One wow. of which I did through, through a publisher. Uh -huh. um, and it's like, it's, I'm sure it's pirated somewhere because all my shit's pirated, but, uh -huh. yeah. um, but I can't find it. Like when I sp split from the publisher, he took it with him. Wow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I do like, um, I mean, this will probably segue to another whole nother topic, but, um, I have, I'm a hybrid author. Um, I do, I have contracts with traditional authors or I mean, traditional publishers. But I put out so much material mm -hmm. that I, pro I, I put out at least, at the very least, a short story a month. Or a month. That's cool. And uh, um, sometimes I'll run those short stories through other magazines first. And then when the rights are revert to me upon publication, then I'll put them up on like Amazon or whatever. That's um, a great approach. Yeah, like my mo plus it ad adds kind of legitimacy, not for the reader, but for me. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, exactly. like, okay, this was accepted, so it must be okay. You know, like, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the most recent short story I did was um, Bingo Night, um, which was in Pulp Metal Magazine, I think, two months ago, and uh, which just recently went up. Um, and my short stories are long. They might be like 30 pages or something like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the magazines that publish them have to do it in two separate issues mm -hmm. or whatever. But, um, but that story, like many of my other stories, like, uh, uh, just came out of the blue. Um, these numbskulls in Albany, um, there was a blackout and these numbskulls in Albany <laughs> decided to, to, uh, to like rob a, a, an elderly home, <laughs> you oh, know, and of and of course it went bad, you know, like totally. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I totally got to write that. You know? Oh my gosh. So, Things that are been going night. truth being stranger than fiction once again. Absolutely. Oh gosh. Well, I have to take a look for those, you know, when I'm looking for things to, uh, to consume from Amazon or, or wherever I get it from. Yeah. You know, and I just like, I, I, it, it's one of those things. It's like, uh, I'm firmly of the belief that like, like the, the modern writer, it's all about like content, you know, like if, if, if you're prolific, you're absolutely blessed because th this can be a golden age for you if you're prolific, but if you're not, it, it's just as hard as it's ever been, you know, unless you have that one book that that's making a billion bucks for you or something like that. You know? I, I agree with you that uh, the more you can write, the better off you are. And that's, sure. that's true regardless of what kind of writing you do. It's all about the content. Um, right. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Chase Baker because, like I said, <laughs> I find it exciting reading. I mean, it's the kind of thing I've been reading your stories as written by Ben Sobiek, actually. And, oh, do you like uh, Ben's? Ben does a nice job with those. And... I got to tell you. Oh yeah, um, he's great. It's like looking at kind of like those old matinee movie serials, you know, where there'd be a cliffhanger at That's the end and you would come back next week. And I'm like, oh my god, this is like yep. action adventure from the 30s or something. And uh, yep. but it's but it's modern. And um, yep. so uh, what? That's inspired, what they're all about. <laughs> what inspired you what it, to write the Chase Baker? Was there a particular uh, type of writing or movie even? that inspired you to write these? Yeah, well, I mean, I was one of those nerds who, well, I was never a nerd. <laughs> scratch, the, scratch that from the, from, from the record, but, but okay, yeah. <laughs> but I was one of those guys that like, as a young teenager, I think I saw Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark, or the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think I saw it like a record like 15 times or something like that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding. Like I, I, I was like, when I, I was like, I, I love this. Uh -huh. I love this. And so it, it did two things for me. It like, it like gave me the sense of adventurism that, that still to this day, I just can't get enough of. 
Absolutely. And uh, number two, I was like, yeah. And number two, I was like, I gotta, I gotta come up with a character or whatever. So, um, and get into this action adventure thing. And it took years, years, because I, I wasn't going to be Clive Cussler. I, you know, and I was like, what, who can I come up with? And, uh, and I went down to, where'd I go? I went down to the Amazon and, um, Someone had spoken to me about um, this guy um, who was a guide down there, and he was sort of based, or like, he had, his, his hero was Hiram Bingham, and there was a movie based on Hiram Bingham that came out in the 50s called Secret of the Incas. Hmm. And it was star, and look it up on Google, Secret of the Incas, and it starring Charlton Heston, a young Charlton Heston. It was made in 1954. And isn't it funny that in this movie, Secret of the Incas, Charlton Heston is wearing a fedora. He's got the leather jacket, <laughs> the boots, the pants. He's a tough guy. Um, and it's actually even like, which is more true to Chase Baker, he's even like kind of a male prostitute. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> but clearly, clearly the inspiration for Indiana Jones. Wow. And then I did, a little, I did a little research on it, and I found out that Steven Spielberg had bought the rights to that movie for 30 years. Like, it could not be shown anywhere. Oh, my gosh. And finally, it had come out. So, um, you know, when I saw Secret of the Incas, I was like, all right. I obviously I can't I can't write a Dan Brown character because that to me is I, I, I'm not that crazy about that character but I can't write Indiana Jones it's already been done but I can come up with a character who is sort of like this writer guy and has a background like myself which is like a construction background so he's like a digger mm -hmm. um, and he's got an apartment in Florence and he's got an apartment in New York. And he's he's always unlucky with the ladies, but he's just got this passion. This and he's got a daughter just like me, and mm -hmm. and he's got this passion for like going after like either lost treasures or lost people or whatever. Um, and so like I was literally walking around Florence like five years ago, and I came up with him, and I was like his name's and I was like trying to figure out a name. And I came up with um, the first street I ever lived on, Baker Avenue. And then mm -hmm. I was like, I got to have a good first name for him. And it was Chase. And it turns out there's a Chase Baker who played for the New York Giants. You know? <laughs> so, or whatever. Which I've never heard from this guy or anything like that. But, and, then I, and, and I love like biblical themes and like controversy there and whatever. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I came up with the Shroud Key and like the mortal remains of Jesus. And so, of course... Like the book is like panned by some people because they're like, oh, even just the suggestion of the mortal remains um, goes against right. the whole Christian doctrine, right? Um, but that's not the point of it. In fact, if anything, if anything, um, he has like, you know, maybe there is no mortal remains or maybe there is. You have to read the book, of course. But, mm -hmm. um, but the book has taken me like... I mean, I've almost died writing these books, and I'm not kidding. I mean, I've been all over the world writing these books. The most recent one was in Central America, uh, where I was doing, where I was caving and climbing and all this sort of stuff. This is back in June, and I caught such a bad, su such bad food poisoning that, like, I it was the first time ever I thought, like, you know, I should have been hospitalized. My gosh. But I, but I wasn't about to. Yeah. You know, Go to a hospital there or whatever. Uh -huh. um, but the point of part of the point of the books for me is is like I want the readers to be, to feel like okay, this guy has been to these places and he's yeah. done a lot of the things that are in these books. Um, as opposed to you know he didn't just Google this stuff. You yes. know what I mean? Yes. So they do. Hopefully, have that, they have that feel of 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 authenticity to them. I have to say. I and hope so. They do. And they're so exciting to read. So Thank you. tell us about the latest book, The Shroud Key. Well, The Shroud Key, actually, that's the first one in the series. Oh, that's the first one. Okay. 
That's the first one. That's the one. Uh, that's the one that we're giving away. I think actually. Yes, today. that's right. Tell us about the shroud key. The shroud key is the one. Um, that's the one about the search for the mortal remains of Jesus. Oh. Okay. Um, takes place. Yeah, I mean, it goes all over the place. It goes from like uh, it goes from Florence to Rome to. Uh, uh, I think maybe Jerusalem. Does it go to Jerusalem? I'm not sure. Um, but I have been to Jerusalem to study some of these novels. Um, mm -hmm. And it ends up, it ends up actually goes back to New York. Um, and it, it's, it's Chase Baker fighting like, you know, if, um, he, oh, it goes to Egypt. This, this, I have, to, I wrote the book so long ago, I have to actually remember now. I actually went to, Egypt during the revolution mm -hmm. um, to do research on this. And uh, one funny story is there was no one, no tourists in Egypt at the time. And uh, I ended up uh, going into like the third pyramid in Giza mm -hmm. um, all by myself. And I climb all the way down in and there's just, there's just nobody there. And so you're all alone inside this pyramid. And so, so I decide to like get into the sarcophagus and lie down inside it. And I'm staring up at like, not only like, you know, five or 6,000 years of ancient history, but like tons upon tons upon tons of this, this granite and stone. And like, mm -hmm. so that was kind of a trans, transfixing and transformative moment for me in the research for that book. But uh, wow. but it's all about like you know I trailed like I went on the you know the hunt for like how Jesus went you know Jesus went to uh, Egypt and then you know his travels and wherever he ended up and of course he ends up in uh, um, being crucified in uh, in Jerusalem and like is it possible that there's an ossuary with his bones in it because they have found the ossuaries of his brother James and they found the ossuaries they claim of uh, Mary and Mary Magdalene and all this. So is it possible that Jesus, Jesus's bones were there as well? Um, you have to read the book, but um, one of the big things, the map for him, the map for Chase Baker is none other than the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Shroud of Turin, and this took a lot of research as well, there's actual, there actually are maps on the Shroud of Turin. It's not just Christ's body, but there are actual maps, and part of that map matches that the matches almost to the T the layout of the pyramids of Giza wow. and even the minor pyramids that are right beside it. And actually, it's true; it does. That's fascinating. Which, which also mirrors the Belt of Orion. <laughs> That's really fascinating. Yeah, so it's got all that in there. So if you if you love that stuff, which I do, give it a read. And it's a fast, fun read. You know, I have got it's to not look a it's, book. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. So that's fantastic. Wow, is there anything out now that you would like to uh, talk about? Um, the latest read? is Chase Baker and the Spear. Uh, here it is, actually. Chase Baker and the Spear of Destiny. Cool. This is the latest. This t actually takes place in Rome, and it's all about the Spear of Longinus that that uh, the Spear that Christ pierced side, or the, the Spear that pierced Christ side when he was on the cross. Hmm. Um, and it's all about a, uh, and also based on fact again, uh, based on a uh, a Nazi who wants to start the Fourth Reich. And he wow. was one of the one of the original guys who found this back during the Third Reich, and uh, he's still alive and wants to start the Fourth Reich. And so Chase has to go after the spear. But what happens in the meat? The spear is actually broken in two parts, and uh -huh. the Pope has part of the spear around him. Huh. And so what what the what the what the neo Nazis do is they kidnap the Pope, and Chase has to Chase has to get the Pope back. Does the bad guy's face melt at any point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, all sorts of stuff like that happens. You know? <laughs> Fun. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. If any of your work was adapted for the screen, who would you picture playing the main character? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'd make a good Chase Baker. No, I wouldn't. Actually, I'm too, <laughs> actually, I'm too short. Um, although Chase is not that tall either. But, you know, it's a good question, uh, actually. Um, it, uh, you, you might have to help me on this. I don't know. Um, who would be a, who would be a good Chase Baker? Uh, Harrison's a little long in the tooth now, I guess. Yeah, he's long in the tooth, and he's he's Indiana Jones. So how about uh, think, Ryan Gosling? What do you think? No, nah, he's too blonde. Too blonde. Mm. He's too blonde. It's got to be more like. Uh, uh, let's see. Um. How about Kevin Spacey? No, he's he's done. <laughs> Dear. Actually, he's he's probably available now. He probably like, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do it. I'll do I'll do it for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Poor Kevin. I mean, yeah. sorry everybody, but really, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. It's I'll do it for a hundred bucks. I'll do it for fifty bucks. <laughs> you can get him cheap. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you can get him cheap. Um, um let's. See. I'm sure yeah. as soon as this interview, I'm sure as soon as this interview is over, I'll, I'll I'll totally think about it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It'll be good. I'm not up on my like actors. Oh, there's mosquitoes. You know what? <laughs> Florence is Florence was built on a swamp, and there's mosquitoes all over the place. Like uh, Venice, built on all those uh, wetlands. Yeah, in the canals. Right? Yeah, there's a lot of bugs. Yeah. A lot of <laughs> bugs, eh? <laughs> right. So, who would be Chase Baker? Um, I, you know, um, it'd have to be a guy like between around fifty. Uh, Matthew Johnny Depp's too maybe. Johnny Depp's too expensive. Brad Pitt is Brad Pitt. He's way beyond. He's too expensive too. Um, I was gonna say Tom Cruise, but he's too expensive. Tom Cruise, yeah. Um, no, nah, it couldn't be somebody like that. It would, you know, it would have to be kind of like, because like like Harrison Ford for Indiana Jones, he wasn't the first pick. It was Tom Selleck. Hmm. was the first pick so like i would prefer like like somebody who's just like you don't really know you don't really know of them you know mm -hmm. um and then he just a newcomer. Suddenly comes out. sort of a newcomer yeah that'd be cool is it and, and that's a, that's a good way for me to get out of this question <laughs> well it's a fair answer in yeah. my opinion can you tell can you tell them that like i don't have my 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 finger on the popular culture pulse because I understand. I know where you're coming from entirely. A lot of my favorite yeah. movies are really old movies. So me too. Me too. Yeah. What can I say? Uh, right, is there anything right. else you'd like to add before we finish up? Uh, nothing. I mean, I think if anybody wants to check out my books, and I would totally appreciate it, is uh, just go to www.vincentzandry.com. Uh, and you have a really cool blog. And and my blog is the Vincent's Andrew Vox. I, um, it does very well. I, I I try to I try not to make it too political or anything like that. I'm not getting into politics, but uh, but I write about all different types of topics, and I try everything from the writing life to the tra to traveling to whatever just happens to be on my mind. I think that's time. great. That's cool. Blogs I like that it. really intrigue me. Those are the ones I like cool. to read. Right. And you, you too. You have a nice blog. You, I love your website. I, I, well, thank you very your, much. We, your website is inspiring me. I need a new website. Oh, thank you. Well, you inspire me as a writer. So oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank, thank you, you for having me. Oh, it was my pleasure. Believe me. Thank you for being here. And Thanks, um, sure thing. And with that, I will simply say, uh, remember to check out the Crime Cafe. Um, nine book set and short story anthology the buy links you can find on my website debbymack.com d-e-b-b-i-m-a-c-k no e after the i in debbie.com and go to the crime cafe link to uh, find the buy links as well as the subscribe buttons to the podcast and you can find crime cafe merchandise there too so until next time have fun reading, and I'll see you in two weeks.